have an interest in our public lands. I would especially like to thank Chairman Lingenfeller for coming from Kingman today. I know you had to take a red eye to get here <laughs> from Arizona. In fact, it sounds like you all had to do the same thing to make it here. It, it's appreciated. Everyone on the panel today is serving their local or state government in some capacity, either elected or appointed. And for the most part, while also running a second business of doing an, what they call another day job at the same time. I know this can be thankless work, but county and state governments have the pulse of our communities. So we thank you for your service. This weekend, at the invitation of Ranking Member Grijalva and Senator Sinema, Secretary Hallen toured the Grand Canyon's South Rim to discuss a proposal, and I'm gonna say this, I'll hopefully not hack it up so much, ba na go i tu covini Grand Canyon National Monument. Butchered, I'm sure. While I'm generally in the business of encouraging visitation to the Grand Canyon and Arizona's public lands, Secretary Howland and my friends on the other side of the aisle apparently like to keep their tours a bit more exclusive. During this particular visit, they failed to include those who represent the local communities, including officials from Mojave County, who would have been impacted most by the designation of yet another national monument in the state of Arizona. Instead, elected officials from communities much further away, known to be friendly towards both the secretary and this proposed designation, were invited to attend. Nothing about this is surprising, and in fact, tracks with the manner in which the Biden administration continues to lack transparency, expand the power of the executive branch, and ignore the will of the people, all while espousing grandiose ideas like social and environmental justice that far too often leave our rural communities further behind. Time and again, this administration, whether through monument designations or through the recently proposed BLM Conservation and Landscape Health Rule, is looking for ways to slowly restrict access to our lands. It is a bit like the old frog in the pot of boiling water. At first, you're just seeing cold water. Nothing to see here, just small monument designation with 100% support from the stakeholders. A great thing, right? Before you know it, the frog is boiling. Americans have lost access to nearly all federal lands for permitted activities, like hunting, grazing, snowmobiling, timber harvesting, mining, and oil and gas leasing. While this might seem like a reach, it is our responsibility in this committee to prevent the proverbial frog from boiling. I can tell you that with my constituents are very concerned with about access. They are worried about this frog boiling. They do not want another national monument to lack access to their favorite hunting spots, to draw away from development and tourism in, in far northern Arizona, and perhaps more importantly, the opportunity to provide critical minerals and careers in underserved communities in our state in an environmentally sound manner, free from Chinese influence and unsound labor practices. My constituents and stakeholders in Arizona are also worried about the proposed BLM Conservation and Landscape Health Rule that we will discuss here today. This proposed rule would fundamentally change the way the BLM carries out its multiple use and sustained yield mandates without, I may add, authorization from Congress, a very important detail. In response, stakeholders across the industries and across the country have expressed concern that the Biden administration will use this rulemaking to determine that currently permitted activities on BLM lands, such as grazing, energy production, and recreation, are incompatible with the conservation lease or areas identified as intact landscapes. Despite what is being labeled as seismic shift in land management by the media, BLM cannot answer basic questions about the proposed rule. Sadly, BLM's ignorance on implementing this proposed rule is not a surprise given the lack of stakeholder engagement, its development, as well as its limited time frame for comments and feedback. Since his first day in office, President Biden has abused the authority of the Antiquities Act to add large swaths of acreage to the federal estate, reducing public access in the process. Instead of adding to the federal estate, as these proposals suggest, we should be discussing the real issue at hand the multiple use and sustained yield doctrine was authorized by Congress. Over time, the executive branch continues to slowly but surely chip away at this doctrine. The result, our local states, counties, and communities are paying the price. Do you think that search and rescue, fire service, or schools in rural areas are free? No, they're not. Do you enjoy hunting or riding an e-bike on a nice trail? Good luck with that. I'll do you one better. I bet every single person in this room uses a cell phone. 
These phones require components that must be mined, and I would argue that we can do that better here in the U.S. than they do in China. They can hardly afford the upkeep on our vast federal estate as it is. For, former Democratic Majority Leader Harry Reid once fought hard to enact the Southern Nevada Public Land Management Act, which sold off excess BLM lands in his home state and reinvested the proceeds into Nevada State Educational Fund Conservation Projects, Preservation of Sensitive Areas, and Unlocked Las Vegas. I would make the argument that if this is good enough for Harry Reid, it should be good enough for us. I would argue the Biden administration to work with Congress to once again look at this model rather than to use their time in attempting to unlawfully circumvent Congress to rewrite FLIPMA, expand its mandate, and restrict the Americans' public access and use of federal lands. With that, I will recognize, turn and recognize the ranking member, Stansbury, for her statement that it, what she may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too want to welcome all of our witnesses uh, who are here with us today. We know you traveled at great lengths to get here and we're really grateful that you're able to be with us. Hearing from individuals across our communities who represent states and local governments is indeed very important. But I will note as we're getting started on this hearing that this is an oversight hearing over primarily a BLM rule. And I think it's noticeable to note that BLM is actually not present in the room because they were not invited. So while it's important to hear from our communities, I think in our oversight role, it's also important to hear from the agencies themselves. We all have places that are important and even sacred to us. For me, in my hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico, it's the Sandia Mountains, which I live near. For many of our communities, these spaces are not only important to their cultures, to their history, but also to the continuation of their identities as people. For indigenous communities, it's places like Chaco Canyon, Bears Ears, and Oak Flat. For our land grants and other communities that use these lands as working lands, it's their important places to gather firewood for sustaining ranching and for other resource needs. And of course, these lands are vital to the continued conservation, not only of special places, but also the lands, water, and habitat that sustain us on this planet. And that is really what is at the heart of today's conversation. Our communities began a movement more than a century ago to manage our lands at scale. The goal of this management was to make sure that we were preserving those important places and sustainably managing those so that we could ensure the integrity of those landscapes. To manage these places effectively at scale, we need the best science, the best management tools, and the best uh, ability to collaborate at the local level. That includes working with federal, state, and tribal policies, our, uh, through grants and partnerships, tribal co-management, sustainable stewardship, and public-private partnerships with private landowners. To help provide the federal government with these tools and make clear that the lands were to be managed for multiple uses, Congress passed the Federal Land Policy Management Act in 1976. And while Congress mandated the lands be managed for multiple uses, conservation has long been pushed aside. In fact, 90% of all lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management, which I will note were actually indigenous lands long before the United States arrived, are actually open for oil and gas le leasing. Most BLM lands are also open to hard rock mining, and more than 60% of BLM lands are leased for grazing. Up until now, there has not been an effective mechanism to also ensure effective landscape level and conservation needs. BLM's proposed rule, which we're here to discuss today, will help to fulfill the congressional mandate of multiple use by creating conservation leases, by allowing federal lands for mitigation of harms from other developments like energy infrastructure and other development. The rule will help to accelerate transitions to renewable energy while encouraging restoration of sensitive lands and protection of cultural landscapes. It's helpful for land managers as well. Uh, as we'll hear today uh, from our various witnesses, and I especially want to welcome the one and only Stephanie Garcia Richards, who is the Commissioner of Public Lands from New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico has boldly initiated a pilot conservation leasing program of its own under her leadership. And like so many other things, New Mexico is leading the way thanks to leaders like uh, Ms. Garcia Richards. 
Another federal land management tool which we're going to discuss today is the Antiquities Act. When Congress has failed to act, 17 of the last 21 presidents, including the previous administration, have used the authorities under the Antiquities Act to create 161 monuments. These monuments include iconic landscapes that we cherish. In New Mexico, it's places like Chaco Canyon, El Moro, Gila Cliff Dwellings, and Tent Rocks, places that are not only beautiful, but sacred and culturally important. Nationally, it's the Grand Canyon, Olympic Park, Natural Bridges, and Dev Devil's Tower. These are places that are not only sacred and important, they are part of the iconic landscapes that define us as a country. And the Antiquities Act is a crucial land management tool to help ensure that we're able to protect these lands. The public lands rule that we're discussing here today will help to bring us closer to the goal of a climate resilient, ecologically intact, and culturally preserved landscape. It will correct biases in current practices which Congress intended when it passed the Federal Land Management, Land Policy and Management Act, and along with the Antiquities Act, which is wildly popular across the West, will help to protect sacred places and ensure that we are preserving these landscapes that are important for our community for generations to come. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Just want to remind you, you do have a witness here. There was no suggestion of BLM. They were here last week. And we would have had, if they would have had them, we would have added a second panel. Panel. Now I'm going to introduce the witnesses. First of all, we have, going from left to right, Mr. Todd Devlin, Prairie County Commissioner. Then Dr. J.J. Gojasia, Director of Nevada Department of Agriculture. Third, Ms. Stephanie Garcia Richard, New Mexico Commissioner of Public Lands. And then for my own district, the Honorable Travis Lingenfelter, Chairman of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will be appear in the hearing record. To begin your testimony, please push the on button on the microphone. You, they, you'll see timing lights appear. When you begin, the light will turn green. At the end of the five minutes, the light will turn red. I will ask you to, be, to try to complete your statement at that time. I will also ask and allow all witnesses to testify before member questioning. I now recognize Mr. Devlin for five minutes. Chairman Grosser and ranking member Stansberry and members of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today's hearing on the Bureau of Land Management's proposed public lands rule. My name is Todd Devlin. I serve as a commissioner in Prairie County, Montana since 1995. I'm a president, I'm past president of the Montana Association of Counties and currently serve as chairman of the National Association of Counties Public Land Steering Committee. I am testifying today on, as a Prairie County commissioner on behalf of the Montana Association of Counties. Prairie County is in eastern Montana with a population of 1,100. Our economy is reliant on agriculture, especially public lands grazing, with some oil and gas development and some seasonal hunting. The BLM manages 430,000 acres in Prairie County, or 43%, including 45,000 acre wilderness study area and a few of areas of critical environmental concern. Use of these lands is critical for our existence. The proposed rule from the BLM would fundamentally change the BLM's multiple use mandate under FLIPMA without the necessary initial input from state and county governments, private industry, recreationalists, and impacted stakeholders. Proposing a rule with such drastic implications for land and resource management across the West with a 75 day comment period treats the concerns of intergovernmental partners as second tier. BLM should withdraw the rule or, at a minimum, extend the public comment period to 180 days. Furthermore, the BLM's public sessions must also be expanded to allow the public to offer verbal con comments rather than selecting questions submitted as they wish to address. This effort to re-implement FLIPMA should also be subject to the NEPA process. This would require the federal government to treat state, county, and tribal governments as cooperating agency status in the development of the rule from the beginning and mandate the issuance of an EIS. 
The new conservation easement leases and expanded opportunities to create ACECs, areas of critical environmental concern, will impact all aspects of land management and the implementation of BLM's multiple use mandate. Major changes in flood implementation should be subject to thorough environmental analysis, including potential economic impacts, just as BLM conducts when studying specific projects. The proposed rule would completely change the way ACECs are designated by the BLM. FLIPMA mandates that ACECs can only be designated when the resource management plan is finalized or amended. The proposed rule would grant the BLM the authority to manage lands of unlimited acreage as ACECs without the requirement of a new or updated RMP. This gives the BLM new ability to create de facto wilderness study areas of any size without the input of state and county governments by sidestepping the RMP est establishment or revision process mandated under FLIPMA. Another key concern from the public lands rule is the vague definition of intact landscapes. BLM's unclear definition combined with the proposed rule mandate to analyze landscapes for protection from activities that negatively impact them this would encapsulate untold millions of acres around the United States and intact, as intact landscapes and potentially disrupt necessary actions to make our landscapes and watersheds healthy and resilient, as well as further restricted uses. The final component of the proposed public lands rule is the new authority to grant conservation leases. This could severely limit the active management to combat invasive species, improve forest health, limit the feasibility of livestock grazing, restrict infrastructure maintenance, or even recreational opportunities on federal lands, thus elevating conservation as a use above the rest of these critical aspects of the agency's mandate. To put it blunt, the BLM is word crafting in this proposed rule that would allow a new round of wilderness characteristics inventory that has been prohibited by FLIPMA since 1991 and create de facto wilderness study areas. Chairman Gosser and Ranking Member Stansberry and Subcommittee Members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Devlin. I now recognize Dr. Goenkachia for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Gosar, Ranking Member Stansberry and members of the Subcommittee. My name is Dr. J.J. Goenkachia and I am the Director of the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Having previously served as a state veterinarian for nearly five years under two governors, I had my own mixed animal practice for nearly 25 years. In my career, I've held a wide variety of leadership positions in state and national agriculture organizations as a rancher and as a county commissioner. For 10 years, I served three governors as chairman of the Nevada Sagebrush Ecosystem Council. I have spent my life, as my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather did before me, stewarding the lands that today are part of my family ranch on lands managed by the BLM and United States Forest Service. The federal government owns or manages more than 85% of the state of Nevada, which means that when the federal agencies make rules or change policies, Nevada is often the bellwether for their success or failure. The BLM has the lion's share of these lands in Nevada at 63%. The BLM's legal requirement to manage for multiple use is alive and well in Nevada. Mining, agriculture, recreation, tourism, hunting, fishing, energy, and an abundance of environmental stewardship happens on these lands. Public access is a key component of successful multiple use. Several of the agency's recent actions have made public access and multiple use much more difficult, if not altogether impossible. These policies also have the potential to compromise ecosystem health. I'm concerned if the BLM continues current trends, they could be putting vast ecosystems at risk from reduced stewardship and compromise their ability to do long-term landscape level planning, all while compromising food security nationwide. At the beginning of April, the BLM published a proposed rule that would change the way they operate in the West. The proposal adds an entirely new use to federal law and creates a never before seen leasing system. They propose to change agency wide regulations to evaluate land health and to codify the most restrictive management tool they have, ACECs. All this would be done through this proposal, which has had no advanced discussion or notification of stakeholders, 
no analysis under NEPA, and no economic analysis or interagency consultation because the BLM claims there will be no significant economic impact. They also propose to do all of this without congressional authorization and a totally new use under FLIPMA. The BLM claims that the proposal would put conservation use on par with other uses under FLIPMA, but the rule doesn't level the field. It makes it so that conservation leases would be far more powerful than any other use. The proposed rule would give conservation and these leases the ability to prevent other users from accessing and using public lands if the use is incompatible with the conservation lease. It is also extremely concerning that BLM currently doesn't see an, in an interest in gathering the input necessary to improve the proposed rule. While I appreciate that one of the five public information sessions in Nevada, I'm concerned that in-person sessions are in locations that discourage input from people who actually use these landscapes like my neighbors who would have to drive more than four hours to ask a question. Ranchers in Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, and the Dakotas are simply out of luck or will have to drive 10 or 12 hours. Even then, the BLM only appears to answer questions about their interpretation, not take comment or engage in dialogue. The Nevada Department of Agriculture and our stakeholders want to have meaningful engagement in a proposed rule that will undoubtedly have generations of impact. Quite frankly, when you're not at the table, you can't help but feel that you're on the menu. Unfortunately, this isn't a new trend, as we have heard. Earlier this year, the BL, the BL, excuse me, the Biden administration designated a national monument without consultation with Governor Lombardo as administration, and his comments are in my written testimony. The BLM has also taken other actions to make broad changes to the management. They're currently looking at an additional 25 gigawatts of energy on federal land, and Nevada will play a significant portion. This is concerning for Nevada agricultural community because solar developments largely require conversion of a multiple use to a single use landscape. Public lands and agriculture are linked. The success of agriculture depends on access to, public, to BLM lands and keeping them healthy. Agriculture is conservation and that is the conservation this committee needs to be defending. If grazing is removing away from these landscapes, ranches will go under, Landscapes will be taken over by invasive species and will burn. Wildlife will suffer and other multiple use will become impossible. This will be crippling to Nevada, the West and our country as a whole. The BLM should not forge blindly ahead because they believe conservation leases can be a new business venture for them. Their business, their mission is to ensure they manage multiple use and sustain Leal long into the future. I thank you for the time today and will stand for questions. Thank you, Dr. Gochia. I now recognize Ms. Garcia Richard for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Gosar, Ranking Member Stansbury, and distinguished subcommittee members. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today and express my support for BLM's efforts to better incorporate conservation and landscape health in its management of our nation's public lands. I am a native New Mexican, born on the vast eastern plains of our state and raised in the beautiful Gila wilderness located in the southwestern part of New Mexico. I have family that raised cattle both on those eastern plains and in the northern mountains, and most of the public land I manage has more cows than people. I have the great honor of serving as the Commissioner of Public Lands for the state of New Mexico, and with about 13 million acres under management at the State Land Office and a responsibility to steward our lands for current and future generations, we work every day to ensure our land management practices are sound and reflective of the most current conservation science. There's a lot in this proposed rule we could discuss today, but I wanna focus my remarks on what this means for New Mexico from a land management perspective. First, the rule recognizes the fundamental reality that our public lands are fragmented and our ability to create resilient and healthy ecosystems requires a landscape level approach. In my home state of New Mexico, federal, state, tribal, and private lands are all extensively checkerboarded. We need to look for ways to maintain intact landscapes and prioritize the protection of habitat and other natural resources that our ecosystems rely on. Second, the rule clarifies that conservation is a use on par with other types of land practices. This effort is consistent with the approach we're taking in New Mexico. The mission of the New Mexico State Land Office is somewhat different from BLM in that our primary mandate is to earn money for education from leasing lands. But there is also a lot of similarity with BLM's multiple use framework. We have recreational users, agricultural lessees, extractive industries, renewable energy projects, and pretty much any other land use you can imagine on our state land. And from those activities, we're on track to earn a record $3 billion this year alone. 
Our ability to continue to generate money for education is directly tied to the health and productivity of these working state lands. Conservation leasing must be a part of a balanced portfolio of uses as we work to ensure the health and resiliency of our public lands for current and future generations. I would also like to emphasize that this rule isn't about taking public lands away. It's about explicitly allowing another type of use, which can often occur alongside other land uses. There may be times where various uses are incompatible, but there are also going to be many instances where there are not any conflicts. Lastly, the rule recognizes the importance of making sound management decisions based on science and incorporating indigenous knowledge shared by tribal communities. The pressing challenges of climate change cannot be understated. We need more resilient lands and ecosystems, and to get there, we should learn from our traditional and tribal communities. Let me be clear, this proposed rule is not perfect. For example, state agencies and local governments are not able to hold conservation leases. Landscape connectivity could be better enhanced if the option to lease for conservation purposes is made available to state and local partners. Additionally, the rule shouldn't just prioritize ACEC land acquisitions. There are non-conveyance means, like leasing, co-management, that could also accomplish the objective of pr protecting these resources on a landscape level. Working with private, private, tribal, state, and local partners is often easier, less costly, and at times could be more effective than land acquisition in expanding the reach of conservation efforts and ultimately protecting more resources. But overall, this rule is a significant step forward in improving how we manage our public lands. It would be good for New Mexico and a positive step in modernizing our nation's approach to public land management. I look forward to working through this rulemaking process with the BLM regarding my concerns and suggestions. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and I would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ms. Garcia, Richard. I now recognize Chairman Ling for five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Gosar, Ranking Member Stansbury, and Honorable <laughs> Subcommittee Members. Um, as Chairman of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors and the District 1 County Supervisor, I am here this morning to speak in opposition to the proposed executive action uh, utilizing the Antiquities Act to designate 1.1 million acres of land in northern Arizona as the Baj uh, Nuovo uh, Ita Kukvini National Monument. This latest proposed executive action would devastate the future economic development growth potential of northern Arizona and would have long lasting adverse economic effects on the human environment within Mojave County. The proposed Baj Monument land coverage within Mojave County District 1 alone is 445,160 acres. Land currently managed by the BLM comprises 88% of the proposed monument at 391,936 acres. Arizona State Trust Land comprises 9.2% of the proposed monument at 41,090 acres. The proposed monument also includes privately held land comprising 2.7% or 12,133 acres. These private lands would be forever stripped of their ability to be developed to their full economic potential within a rapidly growing area within my district. Within my district and directly bordering the proposed national monument are the city of Colorado City, Arizona, Centennial Park, Arizona, and Cane Beds, Arizona. The current poverty, poverty rate in Colorado City, Arizona which is experiencing an incredible economic resurgence after so many years under the thumb of monster Warren Jeffs, is a whopping 42.4%. Within Centennial Park and Cane Beds, Arizona, the poverty rates are 22% and 18.8% respectively. The current suicide rate is many times higher than that of the national average and community mental health is slowly on the mend after experiencing generational trauma. Their story is a real tale of resilience and of rising up from the ashes and rebuilding, and that should be applauded and supported at all levels of our government. These communities will be harmed by the unintended consequences of designating yet another national monument right in their backyard, as national monument designations typically have the unintended consequence of dooming the local residents to living in what I like to call poverty with a view. The state of Arizona already has 18 national monuments in existence today. That's more than any other state in our nation. Mojave County, Arizona alone has only 
privately owned land. The state of Arizona and Mojave County simply cannot afford to lose any more lands to the federal government. Nearly 50% of the state of Arizona is now managed and owned by the federal government. Designating another 1.1 million acres as a national monument will further reduce private ownership and harm hardworking rural Americans within Arizona and Mojave County. As I stated previously, almost 90% of the proposed acreage is already under BLM control. And Mojave County fails to understand why the current level of federal oversight and management and working collaboratively with tribal, state, county, and local elected officials and agencies, as has worked well for so long, is no longer sufficient. Also, as a matter of public policy, is forever locking down known American natural resources really the wisest course of action to take when faced with an uncertain future with international players like China and Russia? The only thing placing keeping, keeping out, uh, placing keep out signs on the land does is that it forever hamstrings our citizens from making a living and enjoying the land with multiple uses as they are now. On August 28, 1984, as Public Law 98-406 the Arizona Strip Wilderness Act was, at the time, thought to have once and for all addressed all questions of wilderness and conservation on the Arizona Strip in Northern Arizona. The Arizona Strip Wilderness Act specifically recognized the uranium potential of over one half million acres of BLM, man, BLM and US Forest Service lands in Northern Arizona by releasing them from wilderness classification so they could be explored and mined with overwhelmingly bipartisan support at the time from across the entire political spectrum, the United States Congress had finally spoken and clearly defined the disposition of public lands in Northern Arizona. 26 years later, in 2010, 2011, the Obama administration's Interior Secretary, Ken Salazar, requested the National Park Service to evaluate nearly 1 million acres of lands, now being proposed as the new Baj Monument, for a 20-year moratorium on uranium mining, which was enacted and is still in place today. Internal National Park Service emails from Park Service employees at the time showed that they could not identify a threat to the lands or watershed leading into or surrounding the Grand Canyon, and further, that breccia pipes inside the Grand Canyon National Park, which no one intends to mine, are in fact naturally occurring. If the federal government is looking to prevent uranium mining, it does not require a new national monument designation to deny permits, uh, as we believe the federal government already has that authority. Approximately 90% of these proposed lands are currently held in trust and managed by the federal government for all American citizens. Abusing the Antiquities Act to designate a new national monument would strip away the ability of all interested American citizens to participate in a public process and to have their comments accepted and publicly heard by the federal government. Can we summarize, please? Yes, sir. Um, the County of Mojave takes great pride in the fact that we are rich in natural amenities and we hold the utmost respect and reverence for the Grand Canyon National Park and for our serious responsibility in protecting the park from harm. We understand that tour tourism generates significant economic activity annually from visitors. We are aware that as of today, over 60% of the uranium used in domestic nuclear plants is unnecessarily shipped through ports in Russia. At a time when the United States of America has abundant supplies of uranium in our backyard, this reliance on Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, communist China defies common sense. For those that understand modern mining, it makes no sense when Americans are told that mining domestic uranium supplies is bad, but mining lithium, Super cobalt, and nickel is good. Supervisor, let's cut it off there and we'll get you to the questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I will now recognize members for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for everything they've done so far. So we'll go to the questions. First on the list is Matt Rosendale from Montana. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, unfortunately, um, Director Stone Manning and Secretary Holland have refused to hold hearings in the communities most impacted by this rule, which is what has forced this committee to bring these witnesses here so that their voices can be heard. Otherwise, those states, those communities would be silenced. 
It's clear that BLM has turned into a climate activist organization under this administration. I'm glad we're holding this hearing to uncover the unlawful and unprecedented actions taken by the Bureau. The proposed conservation and landscape health rule is just another example of this administration trying to take authority vested in Congress and place it with the administration's extremist agencies. This administration is threatening Montanans access to public lands to advance their own environmentalist agenda. Changing the BLM's multiple use mandate without the proper input from Congress as well state and county governments is an unprecedented power grab. It will empower the Bureau to approve acreage limitations that could limit critical vegetation management and infrastructure maintenance projects on federal lands. Furthermore, this rule will mandate the BLM manages for preservation rather than meet the multiple use mandate provided under the FLPMA. The fact that BLM had only 75 day comment period for this rule shows that they are not serious about receiving public input on this issue and why this hearing is so important so that we can hear from the people that are gonna be impacted the most. The BLM has also refused to provide the rural counties most affected by this rule with a chance to be heard. Instead, they're holding listening sessions only in the major metropolitan areas of Denver, Reno, Albuquerque, far removed from those stakeholders holders who feel the results from this destructive rule when it clearly contradicts the intent and the language of the Taylor Grazing Act and the law. Rule cannot change law. The law is the law. I seriously hope that they will hold an in-person session in Montana, as I have urged. I'd like to start off with uh, Commissioner Todd Devlin. Thank you so much for being here today. It's always good to see you. You mentioned in your testimony this proposed rule gives the BLM a new ability to create a de facto wilderness study area of any size without the input of the state and county governments. What would be the short-term and long-term results of giving the BLM this power in your county, which about 43% of it is, is currently owned by BLM? Thank you, Representative Rosendale, for the question. It's a good question that's difficult to answer, but I'll try to answer it from, from hometown point of view. My county is Bankhead Jones land. A lot of the federal land is Bankhead Jones, which means it's checkerboard ownership. It's not in blocks. The only block that we have in my county is probably the Terry Badlands Wilderness Study Area. Other than that, it's private, federal, private, federal, checkerboard throughout. So by using the ACECs and conservation, If you take the federal land and put a conservation easement on it or protect it in some way that maybe restricts grazing or prohibits you from feasibly grazing because of the difficulty to take care of your cattle or sheep, it would be, it would be devastating. Um, it would force private to go and get conservation easements and then you have it all locked up. That's my personal opinion. Thank you, thank you. The new rule allows the BLM to grant conservation leases of up to 10 years and unlimited sizes to tribes, nonprofits, individuals, and private entities, but not the counties and states. For what possible reason do you think the states and counties were excluded from this grant program? Because we probably opposed it in the first place. Very good. Mr. Mr. Representative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm on the button, so I will yield back. The gentleman from Montana, the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Lee, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's uh, great to see the witnesses today, especially uh, my fellow Nevadan, Dr. Goykachia. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, address Mr. Rosendale. I'm perplexed that uh, Director Stone Manning and Secretary Holland are not here if it was so important to hear from them today that they did not receive an invite. I also want to Would you yield uh, to a, a response? Pardon me? Uh, Would you yield I, to a response? 
Yeah, I'll yield. What I said is that it's important to hear from the communities. We already know what the director and the secretary, what their initiative is. We know what their agenda is. I think it's important to hear from the communities, okay. which is Thank why you. I was so now stunned I'll reclaim my that time. they didn't hold I'll hearing reclaim my time there. now. Uh, I also want to clear up something with respect to the Antiquities Act. Uh, first of all, the Antiquities Act was created in 1906, and since then it's been used by 18 presidents, nine Democrats, nine Republicans. Uh, when a designation is made using it, there ensures continued access to multiple use. Uh, and more importantly, uh, it has been used uh, by President Trump just recently to, uh, to designate the Camp Nelson National Monument. And when a monument is designated through the Antiquities Act, such as Abiquame in Nevada, it is uh, designated on federal land. It does not give the authority to the president to condemn land from private landowners or states. It simply increases the level of production for important cultural, biological, scientific, and other resources. The Antiquities Act has been and remains a bipartisan success story. Speaking of bipartisanship, uh, it appears today that this hearing is designed to divide, but I think there is so much that unites us when it comes to public lands. Just last month, for, just last month, for instance, this committee unanimously advanced the Biking on Long Distance Trails Act. Uh, this bill, bipartisan, bicameral, that I co-led, will help develop new bike trails on federal lands and make existing trails safer and more accessible. Uh, Dr. Goykachia and Commissioner Garcia Richard, we come from states that uh, have bipartisan administrations where our outdoor recreation adds billions of dollars to our economies each year. Could you please lend your perspective on what those dollars mean uh, to places like Nevada and New Mexico and how bipartisan support for recreation sector helps deliver good jobs and other benefits to our states? Mr. Chairman and Congresswoman, uh, what a great statement and question. I, we say that you know, recreating outdoors is not a red or blue issue. We all recreate. Um, but in New Mexico in particular, uh, we've got 11 national monuments, two of which are our are, are most recent. Um, and around those, uh, we see increased vid visitorship to the tune uh, of a million extra visitors per year in our southern monument, Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks. Um, and you know, from the long lines that we see at our national parks, we know that these outdoor spaces, as, as was mentioned, are iconic, um, are, are really drawing tourists to our area. So just really briefly, in New Mexico, $9.9 .9 billion in annual consumer spending from this industry. $2.8 billion in annual wages and salaries, and $6.23 million in tax revenue. For a small state like ours, we have 2 million people. That's a big boom. Congresswoman Lee, thank you for the question. And yes, obviously, recreation is a huge part of Nevada, and, and that is part of why I guess we are frustrated um, with the conservation rule as proposed. We really feel that we can be an active player in that. We don't want to jeopardize that. Uh, at the virtual meeting, uh, the first virtual meeting on the rule that was heard, uh, a comment was received and the answer was we may have to move a hiking trail if it is non-compliant with the conservation lease. That concerns me. Um, if you move that, my you're question, going- Excuse me, my question was on what the recreational, uh, what the value of recreation is in the state, it, not well, about the rule, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. It, it, is, it is very valuable, very similar numbers uh, to what New Mexico did. And along with recreation, we would also add in uh, the sportsman component of that, uh, which is tens of millions of dollars annually. Thank you. Um, and before I uh, yield my time, I just wanted to uh, enter into the record a newspaper article uh, in uh, response to the statement that the governor was not consulted with respect to the designation of Abiqua May, uh, when in fact he was. So I'll, I'll enter that record into the record. Thank you. The gentlelady, I now recognize Mr. Collins from Georgia for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Devlin, in your uh, 
testimony, you mentioned that the uh, federal government owns 60% of your county's mineral rights. Um, what minerals are located there? Gravel. But more than gravel, there's oil and gas. Uh, there's a Cedar Creek anticline, which was a oiled formation in the southern part of the county that we know of. All right. And uh, industry is coming back to rejuvenate those wells. What, uh, what percentage of that land is used for mining? Very little. I think we have two producing wells. Okay. Um, are you, is there any concern that this proposal rule is going to prevent mining in your, uh, in your county? Could possibly. It all depends on how you interpret this rule. That's the problem. It's very cloudy. Um, Mr. Lingenfeller, I think I pronounced that right. Or did I get close? Is it, I, the same questions to you. I would, I'd like to get an answer from you on that. If I could get the question repeated, was the question uh, the, yeah, the what, minerals? Yeah, what uh, what minerals are located in your area? Uh, Mojave County has a long history of mining, actually. Um, a lot of copper. Um, actually, now we have some international companies that are doing some exploratory lithium mining in my district, actually. Um, um, copper, um, actually turquoise. Um, we've got some, some world-renowned turquoise mining. Um, yeah, I think the copper is what... Gold and also silver. Uh, would this proposed rules are going to prevent any of that from being mined? Um, again, as the other witness has spoken, it, it does determine, it, it depend upon how that is uh, interpreted. And okay. All right. Um, if I pronounce your, wrong, your name wrong, I'm sorry, I'm from Georgia, and we, but Rosendale's about as hard as we get. <laughs> There's a, Mr. Gochin... Gotcha, Chia. Okay. Uh, if I read your bio right, are you you're a fourth generation? Yes, sir. That is correct. Fourth generation. Is there a fifth generation? Yes, sir. There are. There are two little girls at home. Uh, is good stewardship of the land important? Yes, sir. Absolutely. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be here. Well, that was what I was going to follow up with. It looks like you've done a good job since you've been sustaining it through the fourth generation. Also reading it, uh, it looks like you've been state veterinarian, county commissioner, head of the local cattlemen's association. So I would, I would say that you probably uh, care very much not just about uh, your ranch, but the community and the environment as well. Yes, sir, that's right. And, and in addition to chairing the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council for 10 years, that runs our conservation credit system for the state of Nevada in managing sagebrush habitat for the sage grouse. You know, Mr. Chairman, it seems like it, that, that we have seen this time and time and time again. And I'm, I'm, fre I'm, I'm a freshman, I'm new here, 150 days into this thing. But, but every time we have a hearing and, and we hear from people in the places that this stuff is being affected by, we see people that are concerned, just like that gentleman right there, for the fifth generation coming along, of being able to make a living. We see an economy being destroyed for no reason other than some left-wing social agenda experiment that this administration is pushing on the American people. And I am thankful that we have hearings and we have people like that out there to, uh, to bring in. And uh, with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gallego. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the existence of natural monuments is directly relevant to communities in Arizona and across the West. And I was proud to work on the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition to push multiple administrations to use the Antiquities Act to protect Bears Ears National Monument. It is an area of enormous significance to tribes and its protection is an important part of honoring our responsibility. I also introduced legislation to establish permanent protections for Bears Ears so that we did not have to rely solely on administrative action. Closer to my home, I've been proud to co-sponsor the Grand Canyon Protection Act to protect one of Arizona's and country's crown jewels. And now, Arizona tribes, likely voters, and elected officials in Coconino County all agree that part of the Grand Canyon outside the National Park should be protected through monument status. 
It will bring revenue to an area that needs it and protects sacred tribal sites at the same time. There have been other recent Miami designations that we can learn from, including in New Mexico. So Commissioner Garcia Richard, how has the Rio Grande del Norte Miami designation affected the region economically? Thanks so much for that question, um, Mr. Chairman and, and Congressman. And, and I'll just echo what you said before I give my answer, that that monument designation was uh, very important to uh, Pueblo. Um, it's a, a native tribe that we have in, in the northern area of the state. Taos Pueblo uh, was instrumental in the, the recognition of that um, particular monument. Uh, in terms of the increase to the area, and let me just remind folks, this is a very rural part of New Mexico, not used to seeing a lot of visitors, uh, not used to this infusion of economic development. Uh, they saw a 6% increase in their lodger tax. Um, and as a gateway community, uh, that, was, that was very important to that small community of Taos. Um, in addition, uh, the first six months after the monument was created, um, the, the tax receipts for, for food and other services uh, rose uh, also by a 21%. And so that was um, an infusion, like I said, of, of kind of life into yeah. this community um, that relies on the monument for that visitation and those tax dollars. And I actually lived up in northern uh, Mex uh, New Mexico uh, for a couple of years in Española. And so I traveled uh, that area. Yeah, I know. I'm a little bit surprising sometimes, I know. Uh, so I traveled that area a lot. And you are right. In terms of economic development, it is very beautiful country, beautiful people. Outside of Los Alamos, uh, there's not really any big employee base. So the fact that you can, tourism is still creating jobs, especially further away from Santa Fe, it's really important for that area. So I'm very happy to, to hear that occurred. Are there any kind of other non-economic benefits that came uh, from uh, the monument designation? So uh, Mr. Chairman and Congressman, uh, absolutely. So there are sort of the non-tangible pieces that we can talk about. And, and I'll just say, um, you know, New Mexico is a very small state, so two million people, the bulk of which live uh, yeah, okay. in that Rio Grande corridor. The rest of us live in small towns like Española, like Taos, um, for us, um, the, the areas that, that we live in and the landscapes that we were raised in have that feel that, we, that is part of our identity. Mm -hmm. So the protection of those landscapes is, um, I can't be overstated. Now, if you could rewind several years and had the chance to reconsider the monument designations, knowing what you know now, would you still support monument designations for Rio Grande del Norte and Oregon Mountain Desert Parks? Peaks, I apologize. Thank you, um, and absolutely I would, and, and it's not just me, Mr. Chairman and Congressman, that would support those. The support for the designation um, when a poll was taken in southern New Mexico for the Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks by the chamber there um, actually rose, support for the monument rose six months after the designation. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. I'd also like to welcome my fellow Arizonan, uh, Chairman uh, Lingfelter. Thank you for coming and joining us. It's, uh, he's actually a, a, a great commissioner as well as a, quite a, a water expert. If you ever need to really talk about you know, the, the water scarcity issue uh, of the West, this guy's got the brain for it. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. Just a cue, uh, presidents that use the Antiquities Act to reduce the size of designations, Trump, Eisenhower, Truman, Wilson, Coolidge, and somebody more importantly for a future designation is Taft. I now recognize the... Okay, I recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Ranking Member, and to all the guests that have come to provide uh, testimony, thank you very much for the travel and the time. Uh, as I see the as I see the rule that was that is the topic of this hearing, it is an effort uh, with the conservation rule and the, and the discussion around it to create some balance, the landscape balance period, uh, to bring conservation and and uh, the attendant protections uh, that that brings. Uh, to air sensitive areas and areas that deserve that protection. Uh, it creates a balance between the extractive industries, fossil fuel, mining that have had the upper hand 
uh, on decisions that are made around BLM and the usage of the land. This creates a balance. It's a necessary balance. Uh, Mike, and then also the attendant discussion about the Antiquities Act, and in particular, the Grand Canyon designation that the Tribal Coalition is seeking. Uh, I, uh, the Tribal Proposal is, is, is a byproduct, a very direct byproduct of the legacy, the toxic legacy that uranium mining uh, inflicted on those areas, those peoples. Uh, in, industry still has not cleaned it up. And as they walked away, they left a legacy and of contaminated water, land, uh, the, the health impacts, the illness, the chronic legacy. Uh, and uh, Commissioner, is the mining industry's track record in Arizona, as I described it, an isolated in incident, or is that, uh, have they taken full responsibility to protect land, water, and public health in New Mexico after mining is gone? Yep. I'm, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and Congressman, it's, it's like, exactly like you described, uh, the situation in Arizona is the situation in, in New Mexico as well. There have been decades of uranium mining, uh, which we now live with a legacy of. And I'm just gonna give two quick examples because Please. one of them actually is on the land that I manage. Um, there was a Tronox mine there. Um, the tailings from that mine still to this day remain on state land. There is no clear path forward to clean up those tailings or who is going to pay for that cleanup. The other um, issue I'd like to raise is the largest tailing spill in the history of this country actually occurred in the 1970s in Church Rock, New Mexico, right on the border of the Navajo Nation. Um, and it was a devastating um, tailing spill that you know, reverberates its, its, um, and echoes t through today in, in the health of the folks that live in that community. And uh, that legacy, what it's meant to, to the people uh, of New Mexico, uh, and, and the efforts to protect Chaco Canyon, uh, those efforts parallel uh, to a great degree uh, to the efforts to protect the Grand Canyon for the long term. Could you reference that or any comment on that? Yeah, Mr. Chairman and Congressman, there is a lot of overlap, I think. You, you said that, that was a, the decision on, on this newly proposed monument is a direct result of the legacy, I think you could say the same thing for New Mexico. The land that the uranium mining occurred in is sacred to the people of New Mexico, most particularly the indigenous group. So there is Mount Taylor, right smack in the middle of uranium country um, that uh, is sacred to a number of tribes who reside in that area. And then you mentioned Chaco Canyon. Chaco Canyon is a landscape, um, folks see it as a, as a landscape uh, resource that essentially is meaningful to not only Navajo Nation, but also New Mexico's uh, 19 Pueblo. Pueblos. So actually in, in the state land office, we have uh, placed a moratorium on all new oil and gas drilling in the Chaco Canyon area. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, the discussion around the Grand Canyon, it'll go on. Uh, stakeholder engagement will, will, will occur. Uh, to, and, and people will be, will be given the opportunity to comment on, on, on the proposal uh, that the Tribal Coalition has brought forth. But, you know, there was a very similarity to somebody, one of our witnesses said about, we want to be at the table and not the menu. It was the exact same comment that the leader of the Zuni Pueblo said at that discussion with Secretary Holland. We have always, we come to the table, but we're always the menu. And on this instance, uh, there's some balance being created there as well. Uh, the mayor of Flagstaff supports it. Coconino Board of Supervisors supports it. And where most of the proposed monument lies in Coconino County, I should add, hunters, anglers, conservationists, uh, the dozen tribes that are associated with the canyon, 75% of likely Arizona voters support the designation. And uh, so I, uh, this discussion will go on. But the uh, fact that uh, the truth, that real facts and real opinion are going to be are going to guide this decision, I'm uh, I'm I'm gratified by that. Thank you, Commissioner, for your response, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I think the gentleman. I'll recognize myself now. 
You know, uh, Su Supervisor Lingenfelter, there's always a thing about trust. I've always had the definition of trust as trust is a series of promises kept. And I want you to think about that with the following answers. Um, I know that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle are very passionate about this and the, and the other proposed monument designation, quite frankly. But I think we need to keep areas inside their own congressional districts to themselves. Let's talk about some facts when you went over your testimony. Is it true the state of Arizona already leads the nation in national monuments? Dr. Gosar, yes, that is accurate. And you said of the 1.1 million acres proposed, 40% of it would be in Mojave County, right? Dr. Gosar, that is accurate. And 90% of the proposed acres is already uh, under BLM control. Uh, Dr. Gosar, again, that is inaccurate. And you have very little private land uh, in, your, uh, in the Mojave County. Dr. Gosar, uh, Mojave County has 10%. Privately owned up. This isn't unusual. How about Gila County? There, I think they're six percent private. So it's very, uh, 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 very predicated to uh, Arizona. Do you think that this further restrictions by the monument designation and what type of additional restrictions anticipated on federal lands in your communities? What would be the impact uh, potentially be? Uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Gosar. As you know. Um, Mojave County, and specifically in the, in the Kingman area, we have a history of that. We had um, uh, a mine that, that closed down. It was the Duval Mine, I believe, and um, major employment loss. Um, Mojave County has had a history of mining operations, various different minerals. Um, and when we lose that ability to extract the, the, the raw materials, the minerals that our country needs, um, that industry needs, um, Mojave County has suffered. So it goes back to my definition of trust. Has the federal government kept their promise? Uh, in Mojave County's view, I believe that, that they have not. Um, these lands, uh, we believe, are held in, in, in trust for all Americans and, and for multiple uses. So uh, kind of coming back to it, I also am good about good process builds good policy, builds good politics. So if, if it was you know, decided that this was a good idea, why not invite the local people? Thank you, Dr. Gosar. Uh, Mojave County was disappointed that we did not receive uh, an invitation from Secretary Holland. To yeah, I, I find it fascinating that the other side can say, why isn't the secretary here along with uh, you know, others that were invited? Well, I mean, uh, I guess fair, fair place to fair, fair game. So from that standpoint. Dr. Gochia, the proposed rule extends landscape health analysis across the landscape. In your testimony, you sounded critical of this, but the BLM has argued that this is what the livestock grazing industry has been asking for years. Can you explain this? Yes, thank you for the question, uh, Chairman. It is important to note that you know, land health standards need to be analyzed and those impacts need to be fully analyzed. I am not sure that the way this proposed rule is written, and again, I've read it so many times, I'm as confused as everyone on here is about what exactly uh, it is trying to get at. But we can't, with a rule that puts conservation leases down, get to the underlying cause if we are not meeting land health objectives. We must analyze those, and that needs to be done through NEPA. I, I thoroughly agree. And, and along with the BLM, we also have Forest Service looking at leasing issues uh, like in Arizona, uh, where we're utilizing a tool, misutilizing a tool from the University of Arizona on uh, animal units per acre. So there, it's not just the BLM that's after this, it's also the Forest Service. Now, Dr. Gochia, as a state official, you know what it takes to develop a rulemaking that can withstand legal scrutiny and will achieve desired ends. In your written testimony, you talked about how BLM has created a system rife with abuse. Can you explain that? Sure, yeah, rulemaking is, is obviously very critical and there's no state agency that would propose a rule such as this without going through the process and without knowing what those sidebars are. I think it's important to note that the Supreme Court has been very clear about what the federal agencies can and can't do outside their, their congressionally set sideboards. Uh, I believe that they are here. They are amending FLIPMA without using Congress, uh, and it will not stand up to a legal challenge, nor would a rule in the state of Nevada if we did not go through the proper process. 
I thank the gentleman. I'm going to propose a lightning round. Yeah, if you like, they, these these folks came for a long period of time. Why not do a lightning round? Would you be uh, able to do that? Sure, I'd like to do Let's my do questions it. first. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, well, I always appreciate the chairman's lightning round, so be prepared, you're all gonna be asked a question. <laughs> um, again, I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Garcia Richards for being here today. In addition to being our state's land manager, she's an educator, comes from a multi-generational family that has been on these lands since before the United States uh, entered these lands, and also is an incredible leader in our state. And one of the things that I really appreciate about our commissioner is the unprecedented effort that she has made to modernize the way in which we're managing our lands in New Mexico so that the statutes that do exist at the state level to manage these lands really reflect the values and needs of contemporary people. And as the commissioner noted, the primary responsibility of the state land commissioners in, in New Mexico is to manage these lands. These are largely state land grant lands that came from the federal government after the US came in for profit maximization because those funds actually go into state coffers. And so the addition of protection of cultural properties, tribal consultation, management for conservation, all of those things are, are modern interpretations of how we manage these landscapes at scale while also uh, continuing to uh, ensure that we are maximizing our fiduciary responsibility to the people of New Mexico. So I wonder, Commissioner, if you could just take a moment to talk about how this BLM rule in some ways kind of parallels what you've done at the state level and how that has enhanced your ability to manage those lands at scale for multiple use and what, if any, impact that has had on your fiduciary responsibilities as the Commissioner. Thank you uh, so much for that question. So I'm just gonna give two really quick examples. Um, and so it, at the land office, what we call this is a lease over lease. You have someone who already um, holds uh, primarily a grazing lease. Um, and we uh, have folks who would like to, I'm gonna give an example of a birding location. So we have the Audubon Society has come in and actually in partnership with the grazing lessee has developed a site uh, where you can visit um, the, the largest number of migratory bird sightings in the, in the western United States at this facility. The grazing lessee actually helped us create the habitat around this facility and now we have um, this, this lease for multiple use. Uh, the other example I'm gonna give is that we have an oil and gas company in the southern part of our state, uh, EOG Resources, who has noted that there is the presence of um, an endangered plant in one of their sections that they lease from us. They are actually undergoing now the instrument of a grazing lease, uh, uh, sorry, a conservation lease to protect that area um, with the blue tharp that is located there. And Commissioner, when you began these efforts to modernize the state land office, I think similar to many of the arguments that we hear at the federal level, there was a lot of fear mongering that, oh my gosh, if we manage these landscapes at scale and we include conservation, it's going to compromise our ability to do resource management and uh, to make revenue off these lands. But can you tell us, what has been the outcome of oil and gas revenues in New Mexico since you took office? So uh, the, the new conservation leasing has not come at the expense of record revenue that we continue to enjoy uh, into the land office. This is merely um, creating another means for us to draw revenue and uh, care for the health of the land. And in fact, Commissioner, isn't it true that actually the state of New Mexico has seen the largest intake of oil and gas revenue on state lands ever in the history of the state of New Mexico over the last three years? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Congresswoman, we broke a billion dollars my first year in office, two billion my second, and we are on track to break three billion dollars in one year for the first time in our history. Thank you. So, you know, this this rule is another tool. It's a tool in the toolbox. And uh, I do appreciate the comments today. I think all of you have provided very useful comments. This is why we have hearings, as was noted. And this is also why the federal government uses the federal register and comment periods to try to refine rules, as was noted. Um, and I do think that there are some improvements to this rule that can be had. That's why this process exists. And certainly we'll be following up not only from some of the testimony 
testimony today. We've also heard from the solar industry. But I also find it ironic that there's been some argument here today about the need, and, uh, and I agree wholeheartedly, as did the chairman, uh, of using NEPA and our other permitting tools and our regulatory tools to make sure we hear from the public. And so it's ironic that um, we're having this conversation in this committee because I've sat here for the last several months listening to my colleagues talk about why we need to gut NEPA and expedite permitting and not hear from communities. And right now they're at the negotiating table with the president trying to gut NEPA uh, across Pennsylvania Avenue. So it's a, it's a little bit of a mixed message here. Finally, um, I do want to thank uh, folks uh, who have come and testified today um, from Arizona. And I do, I do respect uh, the chairman's comments about keeping, um, you know, to a focus on what happens in your own district. However, I do want to note that the Greater Grand Canyon, Chaco Canyon, Bears Ears, and Oak Flat areas, which are in other districts other than my own, are sacred to the people who live in my district. And they are a moral and a actual legal trust responsibility of the federal government to make good on our promises to protect these lands for indigenous communities and to do proper consultation. And I encourage folks who are seeking to develop areas for uranium mining to have conversations with the communities that are living with the legacies um, because while it might provide a few hundred jobs for this generation, I will tell you that there are thousands of New Mexicans, multi-generational uh, families in New Mexico who are living with a legacy of cancer, who have died too young, and who are still living with a legacy of toxic water in their communities. It's not worth it, and it's not needed. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I very much appreciate today's conversation and look forward to the continued conversation. Hey, so rid of the, the, the clock. So, but I would like to do a lightning round if you guys wouldn't mind. So you yeah. want three minutes? Three minutes? We'll go three minutes. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah, the, the gentleman from Montana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, Montana, we have state trust lands as well. And, excuse me. Okay. okay. Uh, we have state trust lands as well, and everything, Ms. Richard, that I heard you referencing was the, the state trust lands. And guess what? We do a great job managing our state trust lands as well. I had the, the privilege of serving on the state land board for four years. I was the state auditor. So I was responsible for those lands, 4.7 million acres. And they were managed a lot better than the federal lands. We harvested our timber, we mine our minerals, and we extract oil and gas. Uh, additionally, we protect our air and water the whole time that we do that. We have tremendous access for public to enjoy these lands for recreational purposes, and they do just that because they are healthier. They are much healthier than the federal lands, which in many cases, hundreds of thousands of acres look like moonscapes because they haven't been managed properly. We generate 40 to $55 million a year for our K-12 education system because of proper management of those lands. But I can tell you something. The people from Montana are the ones that manage those lands, not some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., who doesn't know anything about the management of those lands. Meanwhile, we're trying to impose additional rules, which again, I will state, are in complete violation and contradiction of the Taylor Grazing Act, the law, the law that says what those lands are supposed to be used for. That being said, Mr. Uh, Goyakachia, in your testimony, you mentioned that the BLM elected to forego the NEPA analysis altogether in promulgation of the rule. Are you aware of any other situation in the many years of your public service where the BLM has foregone the NEPA process for a rule this impactful? No, sir, I am not. The BLM claims that this uh, proposed rule will not have an economic impact on a substantial number of small entities and thus is not subject to review under the RFA. Do you disagree? And if so, how will small entities be affected economically by this proposed rule? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I wholeheartedly uh, disagree, as does the state of Nevada. Without a thorough socioeconomic analysis, we cannot 
really know what those economic impacts are. If you take a producer off of a land for five or 10 years, whether it is grazing, mining, uh, a, a campground, for example, what are those economic impacts to that community? They are great. And in the case of a rancher, they will be out of business. They cannot sustain it if they are removed because they are non-compliant with the conditions of a lease. And to say that it will not have a financial impact is erroneous. And if we put the ranchers out of business, what happens to the local automobile dealership, the grocery store, the grocery store? What, what happens to those businesses? Sure, they go out of business probably just as importantly as all the other stewardship of the lands around that that are occurring are going to go away as well. The Bureau needs help to do this work, and it's always been ranchers at the top that are doing that work. And if they're gone, the landscape suffers, the local businesses suffer, the grocery store suffers, the schools suffer, and then we end up with isolated communities and poverty and suicide and everything else that we have heard about from my colleague to the left. Thank you for your testimony today, Mr. Pagoya Cachillo. I thank the gentleman. Chairman, the gentleman of the uh, ranking member for the full committee is recognized for his three minutes. Commissioner Garcia Richard, let me, let me go back to, to uh, a discussion that's kind of interwined with everything else we're talking about. And, and, and I do admire and, and respect the work that uh, New Mexico and your office has done to deal with the issue of balance, to deal with the issue of inclusion, and, and to uh, look at your landscape in a thorough way. And uh, monument designations under the Antiquities Act, the nexus being the indigenous community that drives that decision. And, and I find it, and regardless of uh, the support that a, that, that a designation might or might not have, uh, the interest in limiting or preventing that are, are always very strong. And I noticed almost every controversial issue dealing with extraction, whether it's the Grand Canyon, whether it's Chaco, whether it's resolution, whether the list goes on the boundaries, uh, almost those controversies that come to light have always been, there's also a legacy there, and there is significant indigenous involvement and presence and, uh, and demand on those issues. And that's the balance issue, and that's why tools like the Antiquities Act, the rule, and others uh, are so vital and so important. Could, the point and the question is, in this search for balance and landscape balance, uh, New Mexico is a, is a great example. And, Tell us about that effort and tell us about uh, the difficulties in getting to the point where you're at now. So Mr. Chairman and Congressman, uh, New Mexico still has alive and well and thriving 23 tribes, 19 Pueblos, the Navajo Nation, yep. and three Apache Nations who have been there since, as was spoken before, before New Mexico became a state, before many of our families arrived in those areas. They manage that land, and I, I have a, a modern day example actually to give you today. They manage that land for pristine nature. That the, 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 the land resource is part of their identity. And we have a modern day example in the Mescalero Apache who uh, manage uh, probably one of the region's most pristine forests they have been able to withstand wildfire damage from all areas because of the management of that forest. So this is a, a resource um, that goes to the heart of, of indigenous uh, culture and identity. And so when we are going back to looking at what should occur in a certain landscape, what designation should happen in a certain landscape, I believe it is always indigenous communities, indigenous knowledge that we should look to first and foremost. So that's what we've done in the state land office. When we decided to do a moratorium on Chaco Canyon on new oil and gas leasing, we spent a year visiting Navajo chapter houses, inviting Pueblo tribal leadership to tell us where the places were that needed protection. Thank you. You're back. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady, the ranking member is recognized for her three minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm actually going to follow on uh, Ranking Member Grijalva's questions because I think that what, uh, Commissioner, what you just spoke to about the kind of consultation that you did with tribal communities was new in the history of our state land office and in some way, again, parallels what the federal government is trying to do under Secretary Holland's leadership and the BLM and other federal agencies, which is to not only make good on our treaty and trust responsibilities to our tribes, but also to ensure that they have a seat at the table and that their cultural values, their historic landscapes, and their sacred places are a part of the planning process. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the effort that you have undertaken since you've taken the role as the state land commissioner to do tribal consultation at the state level, which is actually quite unique, I think, nationally, and how that's enhanced your ability to protect those landscapes. Thank you so much for that question. So uh, initially what we did was pass a cultural protection rule, um, which requires archeological surveys and tribal consultation before a spade of dirt is moved on state land. And the reason is because we don't have the expertise for cultural sites that may exist on the land, for landscape um, preservation. You know, we've heard from tribes that, that there are natural resources that are considered to be tribal cultural properties, TCPs. I don't have that knowledge. I'm not an indigenous person. So we look to, to those folks, we look to their background, we look to their knowledge of this landscape to inform the, the work that we do before we do the work. Um, like I said before, we have been able to do this preservation, this consultation, and not risk a dime of our revenue. We still feel that it's important. It has not slowed down our business, it has not impacted our revenues, but it is necessary nonetheless. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that's really important to talk about, especially since we don't have any witnesses here today that are from tribal communities or tribal leaders, is the ways in which that consultation has helped to transform also not only the opportunity to protect and preserve those spaces, but to revitalize their use for cultural purposes. I had the tremendous opportunity last fall to go join the rest of the delegation and both Pueblo and Navajo leaders at Chaco Canyon with Secretary Holland. And one of the things that I was particularly struck by talking to some of the Pueblo leaders is the ways in which the cultural and religious knowledge and connection to that landscape has been passed down for dozens of generations. You know, we're talking thousands of years. And since there has been an effort under the current administration to invite tribes to the table, not only for planning purposes, the use of that space is now being used as a cultural space again for dances and for other cultural uses, which is so core to, as you said, the identity of the people of New Mexico. So I thank you for your work, and with that, I yield back. I thank you, lady. Um, Dr. Gochia, um, the federal government promised uh, a payment in lieu, of in lieu of taxes and secure rural schools. Do those exist anymore? Do the two programs exist? Is that your yeah. question? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do exist, sir. And, and how much money that we were promised actually comes out of those? Uh, not nearly enough money to uh, operate the local governments. Probably less than a penny of what yes, we sir. were promised, out of every dollar. Uh, Supervisor Lingenfeld, does PILT really contribute to your bottom line these days? Chairman Gosar, uh, as I noted before, Mojave County has 10% private land ownership. So PILT um, plays an incredibly important role in um, providing the services of government in Mojave County. Um, we, we get probably a fraction of what we should. A fraction, I wanna make sure you understand that. And also when you have a designation like this, you also have a lot of the oversight, you know, search and rescue, uh, hospitalizations, all those kind of things fall into you, right? Chairman Gosar, that is absolutely correct. Hmm. Well, you know, I acknowledge that, you know, uh, uh, tribal uh, consultation is something to have a conversation about. It's long, uh, long overdue to have a conversation about the sovereignty issue of tribes and the relationship with states uh, in this country. So uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of and been pushing for that. Uh, 
Supervisor Lingenfelder, how would uh, hunting, fishing, ATV, ATV, and potential other uses be implicated by a monument? Um, Chairman Gosar, as we understand it, um, and in speaking with our ranching community, our agricultural community, um, those that um, come for outdoor recreation, um, Mojave County is very strong in natural amenities, and obviously we have a lot of um, you know, side-by-sides and, and those types of things. Um, there's a lot of concern uh, about um, things that families do together uh, in, in ranching communities that are generational ranching families in Mojave County. We have five, six, generations of ranching, at least, um, that those would be negatively impacted. So I, I'm going to start uh, uh, from the far left. Uh, what was a question that you wanted to be asked and it wasn't asked? And what is the answer to that question? Start with you. Why do you want cooperative agency status, Representative and Mr. Chair? We want it so that our locals and those that represent the locals have a seat at the table. That's what it's all about, whatever the topic may be. When it comes to the management of federal lands and affecting people that are my constituents, I want to be at the table and so do my constituents. So local consultation, right? Correct. Dr. Go Chidia. Well, thank you very much. Uh, local consultation is obviously a big one for me. But I guess the question I would like answered is, what are the tools that this is giving the BLM that they don't currently have? And my answer to that would be, number one, I don't know after reading the rule five or six times. And number two, I don't believe any after reading it that many times. The BLM Foundation is already in place. It can do a lot of this work. It can enter into agreements. Nevada has demonstrated it can effectively enter into agreements and have meaningful conservation projects on the ground. Do we need them on public land? Absolutely. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I think we have the tools we have now. An agency is overburdened. They can't do the work they're challenged with now. And we're going to put another level on top of that. And we're going to see other things slide. I would love to be just like New Mexico, um, have consultation. And I, I sure hope that the 63% of BLM lands are afforded the same consultation as New Mexico affords their state lands. Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity. I was actually hoping to have a little bit of a, a more of a conversation, uh, especially around how state land uses our conservation leases. Uh, in particular, it was mentioned that our ranching community uh, manages the land for conservation already. And so what we have done is take advantage of those practices, put them into our conservation lease, and we are actually piloting a couple of uh, projects on rangeland health which our biologists, our rangeland ecologists, have been a part of developing. Um, and I'd like to see uh, this, this particular rule have the same impact on, on ag lessees. Great. Supervisor. Thank you, Chairman Gosar. Uh, as the first gentleman spoke, uh, Mojave County, we just want to make sure that the local uh, involvement is retained and, and that we're involved. It makes a big deal. Well, I thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under committee rule three, members of the committee must submit questions to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, May 30th. The hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for their responses. If there's no further business, without objection, 